You're listening to Kalam Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at kalaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash kalaminstitute. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asiratul Nabawiya, the prophetic biography. In the last few sessions, we've been talking about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam establishing and settling the community in Al Madinatul Munawwara, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's community in the blessed illuminated city of Medina. We've talked about a lot of different things from the Prophet ﷺ establishing the masjid to establishing some type of social order there. The Prophet ﷺ connecting and removing uh, the grievances or the um, you know conflicts that existed there amongst them in the past. We also talked about how the Prophet ﷺ he established his own residence and settled his own family. And in the previous session, we talked about how now the Prophet ﷺ established congregational prayer. And that was, of course, with the initiation of the practice of Adhan. So we talked about the Adhan in the previous session. What we're going to be talking about today um, were a couple of, the f- a couple of firsts for this new community in Medina. This new Muslim community in Medina, they, they had a couple of firsts, meaning their first couple of major like community experiences. So a part of any community, of course, a community is made up of people. And what naturally happens with people is life and death. Right? There's life and death is a normal part of the human, it's a part of the human condition, the human reality, the human experience. Babies are born, people die. All right? It's a part of any community. And we know as a part of our community, in fact, one, one of our brothers was just telling me uh, about the birth of his uh, daughter, and he was telling me about their having an aqiqah for his daughter. So just like that, in any community, you have babies, you have children that are born, and it's a source of happiness within the community. And it really helps, especially if you can imagine a young, a young community, a very young, fresh community. And all of a sudden, if there's a child born in that community, it's a huge source of celebration within that community. Likewise, death is something else that is a natural part of life. It's a natural occurrence. And it's something that happens in every single community. And whenever there's a death in the community, it's also, again, something that bonds and brings the community together. First and foremost, the news spreads. Everyone informs one another. People get together for the uh, ghusl and the takfin and the janaza and then the tadfin and then condolences and ta'ziya and visiting and offering you know, your condolences and support to the family members. So death is another experience that brings a community together. Now the Prophet ﷺ, when he established his community in Medina to Munawwara, it of course again was a natural, human, organic community. And so they also had similar experiences. One of there are, there's a couple of different narrations, but generally speaking, the majority of the scholars of Sirah, the scholars of Hadith, the historians, and the more authoritative, authentic books of Sirah actually mention that the very first death that occurred in the community of Muslims in Medina was actually a very tragic passing, and that was the passing of Abu Umama As'ad bin Zurara. His kunia was Abu Umama, and his name was As'ad bin Zurara. Now the thing about As'ad bin Zurara is that As'ad bin Zurara was, you know, one of the leaders of this Muslim community in Medina. Um, when the when the Muslims, the very first time that they interacted, the Ansar, rather I should say, the Ansar, the very first time they interacted with the Prophet ﷺ was during the season of Hajj, was at the time of Hajj. And they met the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ, you know, basically asked them, may I speak to you for a minute? And they said, sure, absolutely, why not? What do we have to lose? And there were six or seven of them, and they sat down, and the Prophet ﷺ spoke to them and presented a song to them, and they said, do you mind if we have a minute? And the Prophet ﷺ said, absolutely, take your time. And he stepped away, and they consulted with one another, and they said, this seems to be the same man that the Jews oftentimes talk about, the prophet of the last times. We should, 
you know, we, we, we should be the first ones to align ourselves with him. And they basically accepted Islam and took the shahada. They returned back the following year with 12 people. Five or six of the repeat individuals from the first year. And now there were a total of 12 people and they came back the second year. And now they not only accepted Islam, but they gave the bay'ah, they gave an oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. The following year after that, now this is the third meeting, there were over 70 individuals that came. And all of those first initial 12 were all amongst them. And they all accepted Islam and all 70 of them gave the oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ appointed 12 leaders. They went back, they took Musa ibn Umayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu with them to basically come there and educate their community and lead their community and conduct more da'wah and convert more people to Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ appointed 12 leaders, an nuqaba Right, Ithna Ashara Nuqaba, he appointed 12 leaders amongst their community. Asa'ad bin Zurara, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the reason why, if, if you go back and maybe you've attended the dars or if you go back and listen to the Sira podcast, you'll recall that we've already talked about all this in detail. The reason why I recount all of this, Asa'ad bin Zurara was present in all three meetings with the Prophet. Not just one, not just two, but three. All three meetings. He was part of that first initial half a dozen people that first accepted Islam from al madinatul Munawara Yathrib at that time at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. Then he returned back the following year and offered the oath of allegiance. Then he came back the third year and again repeat offered the oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact it's mentioned he was the first one to step forward and offer the oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. So not only was he amongst the first 12 that gave the bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ, the oath of allegiance, but he was the very first one. He was sitting right in the front and he very first advanced his hand and put his hand into the hand of the Prophet ﷺ and offered the oath of allegiance. So this is a man of great virtue. This is a man of great, great virtue. And in fact, when Musa bin Umayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was sent by the Prophet sallallahu as a young preacher, as a young preacher to go and preach Islam there in this, this, this city of Yathrib, which would eventually become Medina and spread the message of Islam there, it was Asa'ad bin Zurara who hosted Musa bin Umayr. He was the one who hosted him. And he was the one that basically set him up with all the meetings. He was the one that would make sure that run interference. When Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu first became very upset, who's this young guy who's come to our town and started to convert our people, our young people and all of our people, he's converting them to some new strange religion. It was Sa'ad bin Zurara who stepped in and he said, wait a second, wait a second. I'm hosting him, he's my guest. He vouched for Musa bin Umayr. And he was the one that who convinced Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu that why don't you first sit down and listen to what he has to say. That was Asad bin Surara. When the Prophet ﷺ sent Musa bin Umayr the message to conduct the Jumu'ah prayer there in the city of Medina, conduct the very first Jumu'ah that was ever conducted in Islam there in the city of Medina, we talked about this. There are two narrations. Some narrations say that Musa bin Umayr was the one who conducted the first Jumu'ah. Some narrations say As-Sa'ad bin Zurara conducted the first Jumu'ah. And the reconciliation is the Khatib and the Imam was Musa bin Umayr. But the entire Jumu'ah was arranged and organized by As-Sa'ad bin Zurara. And he in fact conducted the Jumu'ah on his property. So even though he might not have been the khatib or the imam, he was the host of the first Jumu'ah prayer. He organized the first Jumu'ah prayer in the history of the Summah. So this is a very, very blessed man. This is a very remarkable person. And he was a fairly young man. He wasn't very old, he wasn't very young. It's not like he was a teenager, nor was he in his 50s or 60s. He was probably in his 30s, early to mid 30s. He was a young man. And very tragically, he became extremely ill. About a few months after the Prophet ﷺ arrived there in Medina, he became extremely ill. There's a couple of different narrations. Some say that he developed some trouble breathing. So he had some respiratory issue. Maybe some type of an infection or some type of an obstruction or whatever it was. But some narrations mentioned that he had trouble breathing. And the, the, the word that's used there uh, in the Arabic language is Zubha aw shahqa. 
Zubha or Shahqa, which basically means like Zubha from Zabah. So it's like becoming, getting strangled. Like your throat closing up on you. Alright, so it's like it's some type of an affliction or an illness or some type of a problem in the throat where you have trouble breathing. And shahqa similarly refers to when a person basically chokes to death. But so he developed whatever it might have been. I don't know what the nature of the issue could be. But he developed some type of an issue where he had trouble breathing. And that led to his passing. Some other narrations actually talk about the fact that he developed a ve- or, or maybe... Because of that infection or obstruction or whatever he had, as he was nearing death, he was on his deathbed, he also developed a very, very high fever. Like he was running a very high fever, his body was burning up. And they basically needed somebody, could somebody had to constantly sit by him and kind of, you know, place like wet towels on him to kind of cool him down because he was burning up from the fever. When the Prophet ﷺ found out that As'ad bin Zurara was so ill, the Prophet ﷺ came, sat down next to him, and the Prophet ﷺ placed wet towels on him, and looked after him, and nursed him. Until eventually As'ad bin Zurara radiallahu ta'ala anhu passed away in this particular condition. And the Prophet ﷺ was very saddened by this and of course performed his janazah and you know arranged for the entire burial and the Prophet ﷺ took part in the washing of his body and in the shrouding of his body and led his janazah prayer and took part in burying him but the Prophet ﷺ at the same time what happened was some of the Jewish tribes and some of the munafiqun who had already started to develop a grudge against the Prophet ﷺ and against the Muslims they started making comments very inappropriate comments and they basically basically started saying that لو كان نبيا لو كان هذا نبيا لو كان محمد نبيا لم يمت صاحبه they knew that As'ad bin Zurara was very close to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ considered him a very beloved companion and a very close friend. They started to say, لو كان هذا, لو كان محمد نبياً, لم يمت صاحبه. If in fact Muhammad in reality was a Prophet, if he was actually a Prophet, then one of his closest friends wouldn't have died like this. Because he was a young man and things like that. If he was an elderly man, it'd be whatever. But they started making this propaganda because he was a young man. So they said, look, this is a sign of the fact that he's a liar and he's devoid of any type of good. That one of his closest people dies tragically like this. This is proof that he's not a prophet. And the Prophet ﷺ was very upset when he heard these remarks. Of course, because he was already sad at the loss of a very devout companion and a very close trustworthy, reliable friend. So the Prophet ﷺ said, بِئْسَ الْمَيِّتُ أَبُوْ أُمَامَ لِيَهُودُ مُنَافِقِي الْعَرَبِ The Prophet ﷺ said that Abu Umama, As'ad bin Zurara, his death is actually a huge, you know, it, it, is, it is very bad for these Yahud and these Munafiqun who are saying these types of things. Meaning that his death is a blessing for him and it's a blessing for the community because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept something great in store and in reward for him. And we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him back. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. But his death will be a curse upon these people who say these inappropriate things about him and his passing. And the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَا أَمْلِكُ لِنَفْسِي وَلَا لِصَاحِبِ مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا The Prophet ﷺ said, I do not control my own fate, nor do I control the fate of my good friend As'ad bin Zurara, all of this is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Alright, so this was that first uh, passing of someone within their community. There are some other narrations which actually talk about the fact, well actually before I mention that, so As'ad bin Zurara was from Banu Najjar. Banu Najjar. They were the ones who lived immediately around the masjid. They were that, that was the neighborhood of Medina where the masjid was located. And so he was from Banu Najjar and he was the leader of Banu Najjar. The naqib, the leaders, the org- community organizers. The Prophet ﷺ had appointed. He was a community organizer for Banu Najjar. After Asad bin Zurara passed and everyone you know, spent a few days you know, kind of getting past it and mourning his loss. Some of the leaders of Banu Najjar, they came to the Prophet ﷺ, سَأَلُوا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم أَنْ يُقِيمَ لَهُمْ نَقِيبًا بَعْدَ أَبِي أُمَامَةَ أَسْعَدْ بِنْ زُرَارًا 
They came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, yeah, O Messenger of Allah, appoint a follow-up leader for us. Appoint somebody in the place of Asad bin Zurara to be our community organizer. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Antum akhwali. Y'all are my uncles. Remember, Banu Najjar was the, was the, the, the tribe that the great-grandmother of the Prophet ﷺ was from. Abdul Muttalib, his mother, Abdul Muttalib, his mother was from Banu Najjar. So the Prophet ﷺ said, technically, y'all are my uncles. Like we're relationship, we're related through my great-grandmother. So y'all are like uncles to me. Antum akhwali, wa ana bima fikum. And I am amongst you now, I live here amongst you as well. فَأَنَا نَقِيبُكُمْ I will be your community organizer. I myself personally will serve my family. I will be the community organizer. And the narrations mention that the Banu Najjar, they used to... فَكَانَ مِنْ فَضْلِ بَنِي نَجَّارَ الَّذِي يَعْتَدُّونَ بِهِ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ أَنْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم نَقِيبَهُمْ And Banu Najjar actually used to brag about this with the other families and the other tribes that, oh yeah, who's your community organizer? Right? And they knew very well who the community organizer was, so they would you know, casually be like, oh by the way, who's your naqib, who's your community organizer? And they'd be like, so and so, and be like, oh do you know who our community organizer is? And they're like, yes, yes, we know who your community organizer You want me to tell you, remind you again who our community organizer is? It's Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So they used to brag about this, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. It's like a fadila, right? It's a virtue. And they used to be so happy, and everybody loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it was like a nice little playful thing among some of the tribes. And the family members that every single time this conversation would come up, Banu Najjar used to always make sure they reminded everybody in the room that uh, let's not forget the Prophet ﷺ, our community organizer. All right, so they used to always brag about this particular fact, and that was a source of pride for them. And of course, this is a positive source of pride. This is a good source of pride in the fact that they had a relationship with Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There are now what I wanted to mention was there are some narrations, there are some weaker narrations to the effect that Asa'ad bin Zurara was not the very first person to pass away. He wasn't the very first person to pass away in, in amongst the Muslims of Medina, but rather the very first one to pass away was a very, very elderly person who was already bedridden by the time the Prophet ﷺ even arrived at the place of Quba, and his name was Kulthum bin al-Hidm. Kulthum ibn al-Hidm. And he was in fact the gentleman in whose home, the Sahabi in whose home the Prophet ﷺ stayed in at night the nights that he, the days that he remained in Quba, he used to sleep in the home of Kulthum ibn al Hidm. All right, so this was, but he was a very elderly man, like he was a senior citizen, and he basically passed away during those same days because he was such an elderly person. So some narrations mention that, and again, there's not really a conflict because the way that we would reconcile the two narrations is Kulthum ibn al Hidm was from Quba, not from Medina. He was from Quba, not from Medina. And he passed away in the days of Quba, while As'ad bin Zurara was for the first Medinan. He was the first Medinan Muslim. The first Madani to basically pass away. Alright? So this is that first experience that this community had, and that was the first death that they experienced as a community, and it really bonded them together and brought them all together. Now, the other experience that I talked about is a birth in the community. That can oftentimes be a, you know, a huge celebration and it can be a huge occasion. And especially, you know, if you remember, if you're talking about a new community, everyone would remember this is the first child that was born in our community. This was the first aqiqah that we had in this community, right? Everyone would recall that, would remember, remember that event. So the first aqiqah, the first birth that they experienced within this community, was the birth of Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhuma was the first birth in this community. Abdullah ibn Zubair, of course, his father is Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and his mother is Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anha. Alright, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So this is a very blessed child. 
Right? And of course, Abdullah bin Zubair would go on to become a very notable companion of the Prophet ﷺ and later on would even do great services in the cause and name of Islam even after the time of Rasulullah ﷺ during the era of the Khulafa al-Rashidun. Alright, so Abdullah bin Zubair came from the, the family of the Prophet ﷺ on his father's side and he came from the, the, the family of Abu Bakr on his mother's side. His grandfather was none other than Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. All right, and so this was a very, very blessed child, and of course his aunt was also the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu Aisha as Siddiqa radiallahu taala anha, and she was also one of his teachers. So after the time of the Prophet sallallahu he would actually learn from his aunt and narrate a lot of a hadith from his aunt and gain a lot of knowledge from her. And he was actually one of the communicators. Whenever, of course, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu would just go and talk to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha because that's his daughter. But when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was Khalifa, when Umar was Khalifa, and he needed to ask questions of Aisha, and he needed to go and consult with Aisha, many times he would send Abdullah bin Zubair to go and consult with her so that he could bring it back and then, you know, first, hand communicate to everyone exactly what he got from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Alright, because it was more direct communication. Her being, Aisha being his aunt, she didn't have to do hijab from him. So Abdullah bin Zubayr would be able to go and sit down in front of her. This is his khala. This is his aunt. Right, maternal aunt. He would be able to go sit down in front of her and ask her the question, Ya khalati, O my beloved aunt, Ya umm al-mu'mineen, O mother of the believers, Right? What is this, this, the answer to such and such question? How do we handle this, this, this? What did the Prophet ﷺ, and she would give him the full explanation. So he's getting it directly, talaqtiyan, an Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And then he would bring that back and lecture that into masjid. Basically, what is the fatwa from our mother, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So Abdullah bin Zubayr is a very, very blessed child. And even his own mother, you know, a lot of times, you know, when, when, you, when you have such, one sibling is so remarkable, you can act, actually sometimes neglect or forget to notice the virtues of the other sibling. Asma bin Tabi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anha, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, she was great and amazing in her own right. When you study the life and the accomplishments and the knowledge and the, the, the generosity and the activism of Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha, you'll be blown away. Unbelievable, remarkable woman. So this is Abdullah bin Zubayr. Now, basically the narrations mention that when, the, when, when Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha made the migration, when she migrated from Mecca to Medina, she was already pregnant. She was already expecting a child. And so she delivered shortly, maybe a month or two, or a couple of months, a few months, after arriving in al Madina of Nawra. Some narrations mention up to five months after arriving, but nevertheless, she was still about halfway through her pregnancy, right? When she arrived there in Medina, and then maybe about four or five months down the road, she delivered this child. Now again, there are some narrations which mention that Nu'man bin Bashir radiallahu ta'ala anhu was also born around that same time. So the way that we understand it is the very first child of the Ansar, the very first child of the Ansar that was born after the hijrah, the migration of the Prophet sallallahu was an Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And the very first child from the Muhajirun that was born in the city of Medina was Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And what was also very, very interesting is that after the Muslims, they arrived in Al-Madinah al-Munawwara and the Jews and the Munafiqun of Medina were very upset that these quote-unquote foreigners have shown up here in our land and have, you know, turned everything upside down when they hadn't really caused any problems. It was just the fact that all the people in Medina were basically accepting Islam and everybody were becoming like brothers and sisters amongst one another, right? They were, they were basically, um, they, they, were, they were taking on their Islamic family, their Muslim family, right? Because remember the Ansar had the Arab tribes of Medina had beef 
Aus and Khazraj had been fighting each other for generations. Now they put all of that aside and they're all like, we're all Muslim brothers and we're all Muslim sisters. And then the Muhajirun show up, a bunch of foreigners show up and they're like, you're our brothers and you're our sisters too. And all of a sudden everyone's one big happy Muslim family and the Yahud and some of the Munafiqun who used to like the trouble, right? Because they were able to pull the strings and basically maintain some type of, you know, um, maintain some type of advantage in the community through all this political maneuvering, they were like, this is taking all the fun out of everything. This is completely relegated our power. I have no leverage. I have no you know, effect on the community. Everybody loves each other. Everybody's all brothers and all sisters. Like this is this has ruined everything for me. So they were very hateful. They were very spiteful. And they said, you know, these foreigners showed up and they ruined everything. We had a good thing going over here. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul said, I had a good thing going. I was basically running this town. This is my town. And this Muhammad shows up, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with this band of like these 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 poor foreigners. The muhajirun radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And they messed up everything I had going on. So they were very hateful like this. And they basically spread a rumor. قَدْ بَلَغَهُمْ عَنِ الْيَهُودِ أَنَّهُمْ سَحَرُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا يُودَلُ لَهُمْ بَعْدَ هِجْرَتِهِمْ وَلَدٌ Right, that a rumor, they spread a rumor in the community that we got some of the magicians. And we got some of the soothsayers and some of the magicians to cast an evil spell on these foreigners that showed up in our land without our permission. We've cast an evil spell on them. We've done black magic to them. That they will have no more children. Their women will go barren. Their men will be infertile. These people will never have any children. Their generations, their progenies will die here. Right, so they started, you know, spreading all these rumors, trying to freak people out, cause paranoia in the community. And of course, the Muslims had solid iman. They didn't believe in, you know, mumbo jumbo and hocus pocus and all this type of stuff. But at the same time, you know, they were just, it was very hurtful. And there was some nervousness at the very least, you know, among some of the Muslims there, that could these people be doing some type of black magic maybe? Right? Could these people try to harm us maybe even? So they started getting worried. And next thing you know, Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha gives birth to Abdullah ibn Zubair. A healthy boy, a healthy child. And she brings this, you know, they bring this baby out the next day. The father brings his baby out the next day. And all the Muslims rejoiced. Everybody was so happy. Especially the muhajirun. Because they realize that all, all this nonsense that some of the Jewish tribes and the munafiqun uh, are saying this is all nonsense, this is all garbage. And we don't need to listen to any of this. MashaAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with a beautiful healthy child in our community. And it put their fears basically to rest. The other thing that's very interesting is that the narration mentions that... So after... Um, after Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha gave birth to Abdullah bin Zubair, Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and maybe after a couple of days when she was able to kind of get up on her feet, um, she comes to the Prophet ﷺ with the child to present the child to the Prophet ﷺ herself. And she wants to present the child, right? It's like they're like family. So she wants to present the child herself to the Prophet. ﷺ. So she says, she narrates this herself, and this is mentioned by Imam Bukhari, Rahmullahu ta'ala, in his Sahih. So she says, ثُمَّ أَتَيْتُ بِهِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. I brought my baby to the Prophet ﷺ and I handed him to the Prophet ﷺ. Keep in mind the Prophet ﷺ is a father, of course. He's raised, you know, four amazing daughters. Right? So he, she says, he took the child, فَوَضَعَهُ فِي حِجْرِهِ he, he put him in his lap. Right? He cradled him. He put him in his lap. ثُمَّ دَعَى بِتَمْرَةٍ He said, somebody bring me a date. فَمَضَغَهَا ثُمَّ تَفَلَ فِي فِيهِ And she says that he basically took just a small little bit of the date and he chewed it up inside of his mouth and he took a little bit of it and he applied it ثُمَّ حَنَّكَهُ He did the tahnik, and the tahnik is after basically chewing it up completely 
Then he took just, you know, like his saliva with the date, I guess you can say the date juice or whatever mixed up inside of it. He took it and then he applied it to the upper part of the mouth of the baby. Right, he applied it to the upper part of the mouth of the baby. ثُمَّ حَنَّكَهُ And she says, فَكَانَ أَوَّلَ شَيْءٍ دَخَلَ جَوْفَهُ رِيقُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. She says the first thing, like the first thing from like food or substance that entered into the stomach of my child was, the, was mixed with the saliva of the, of the Prophet wasallam. So she says, it, I mean, that's a huge blessing, that this was a huge blessing to her child. ثُمَّ حَنَّكَهُ بِتَمْرَةٍ ثُمَّ دَعَى لَهُ وَبَرَّكَ عَلَيْهِ Then the Prophet ﷺ made lots of dua for my child. So this part of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, receive the child, hold the child, he did the tahniq of the child, and then make dua for the child. ثُمَّ دَعَى لَهُ He made dua for the child. وَبَرَّكَ عَلَيْهِ He made lots of dua for baraka upon the child. May the child be blessed, mashallah, he's beautiful, he's amazing, healthy. Like he said a lot of good positive things. He congratulated me. And she says, وَكَانَ أَوَّلَ مَوْلُودٍ وُلِدَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ This was the first child born in Islam. What she means by Islam is in the community of Al-Madinatul Al-Munawwara. Right? This was the first child that was born in the community of Al-Madinatul Al-Munawwara. And so these were a couple of the first experiences that the Muslims had there in their new fledgling community of al Madina, And this was a huge source of bonding, first and foremost through the passing of a very young, you know, uh, very active, valued, and valuable member of their community. And then secondly, through the birth of a child. And the joy and the happiness that comes along with that. So these were a couple of the first. Now why I chose to kind of mention this as well, is because, again, this... You know, when we talk about Medina sometimes, right? It's, it's this legendary, epic community. That sometimes it's helpful to kind of remember that these were, norm, these were people, these were human beings. Exemplary people, sahaba radiallahu anhum. But they were human beings. Right? People who's, who died. Right? There were deaths. There were births. There were good times. There were bad times. There were happy times. There were sad times. There were aqikas, but there were funerals. Right? It was a community of people. A living, breathing community that had these types of community experiences. And from the very beginning, the Prophet ﷺ actively took part in the janazah, and then actively took part in the, you know, congratulating and, you know, celebrating the birth of the child. To show that this is equally as important in the building and the establishing of a community. It is not just buildings that make a community. It's not just formal receptions and formal occasions that make a community. It's not just an election or a board or a website or a list of people or a membership list that makes a community. It is these types of real human organic experiences that make a community. And we sometimes need to remember that. And I say this, you know, uh, as a positive. I say this as a positive. Because, you know, I mention this quite often, but I just mention it to share, like, why, why I'm talking about this. I was actually born and raised here in this community. You know, 12 miles from here. 12, maybe 15 miles from here, down the road, in, down 360 in Arlington. I was born and raised in this area. And we used to be a really, really small community. When a child was born, everybody knew about it. And everybody celebrated it. Everybody got together. It's like a child was born in everyone's family. We were one family. And when one person passed away, it was a tragedy for the whole community. And everyone got together. Everyone cried together. And everyone prayed together. And sometimes when communities become very big, which is its own blessing, mashallah, it has to happen sooner or later. Like this, when communities get really, really big, forget about hundreds. There's thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in a community. Sometimes we can kind of lose sight of what's important at times. But it's important to still be very, very connected. These are very important things. Right? We should know. Right? Who just had a child? And nothing else? Shake that brother's hand. 
Smile in his face. Congratulate him. Ask him the name of his child. Give him a hug. Right? When somebody passes away, I should stay informed of that. I should come to and participate in the janazah. I should find the family members and hug them and console them and make dua for them. And let them know that I'm there for them. These are important community experiences. We are human beings. We're people. We feel. We laugh and we cry. And part of being an ummah, right? All the rhetoric aside, slogans are slogans, right? We shouldn't become a community of slogans. Or we just have cliches and slogans. One family. Brothers and sisters in Islam. No, we have to actually live it. Be brothers and sisters in Islam. Be a family. And that's what lets your family members know you care about them. And you keep, you, know, you keep up with them. And you know what's going on with them. And you cry with them. And you laugh with them. And you celebrate with them. And you mourn with them. The Prophet ﷺ was very particular about this. Right, that we know about this later on, later, 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 much later, almost a decade later, when the community was so huge that now it's tens and thousands of people in Medina itself and around Medina. And every day there are tribes coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, right? Every day there's whole caravans, convoys, coming and going. Really busy, there's a lot going on. And the Prophet ﷺ is older, older. And his health is kind of up and down a little bit now. And so what ends up happening? And he's traveling, you know, back and forth. He's going for Fatih Makkah. Then he's going for uh, Hajjat al Wida. Then he's going for Ghazwa to Tabuk. Right? So he's in and out, in and out, in and out himself as well. And a woman passes away in the community. Right? The woman that used to sweep the masjid passes away in the community. And when the Prophet ﷺ finds out, when the Prophet ﷺ finds out that this woman passed away, he's so upset. He says, where is she? she they say, she passed away, Ya Rasulullah. He's so upset. Why don't you people tell me about these things? You should tell me about these things. You're busy, Ya Rasul. Not too busy for this. Not too busy for this. I need to know about this stuff. And he goes to her grave. And he prays for her there on her grave, at her grave. He makes dua for her. That's a community. Right? So remember this and strive for this. And this was how part of how the Prophet ﷺ didn't just build a masjid and make a treaty and have political alliances. Part of how we establish a community was to celebrate the birth of a child and to mourn the loss of a valued, beloved community member. And that's what brought them together and made the beautiful, illustrious community of Al Madinatul Munawwara. I wanted to, you know, at the, at the end of the dars here, just wanted to take uh, the opportunity. I know there, there were a lot more people here in Salat al Isha, and it was probably announced then. But mashallah, you know, y'all are folks that come every single week and sit in the dars to learn about the life of the Prophet. ﷺ. Part of the responsibility. And this probably isn't a great advertising pitch to come to, to keep, <laughs> to keep coming to the Sira class. But I have to mention, you know, what I have to mention, what is necessary to mention. Alhamdulillah, it's a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has given us the opportunity to sit down every week and learn about the beautiful life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a huge blessing. But that blessing comes with a responsibility. A very easy responsibility. A very easy to fulfill responsibility. And that it is part of our responsibility is now to share this light, to share this guidance, to share this beneficial knowledge with other people, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. We have to communicate the life of the Prophet ﷺ, not just through our words, but more importantly through our actions to the rest of humanity and to the rest of mankind. And alhamdulillah, you know, I always... I always mention this here, and I, I feel like at some point it probably gets nauseating, but uh, I, I'm telling you in all honesty, it comes from the heart. I sincerely, honestly mean it. And that's why I just mentioned a little while ago. I was born and raised here. There wasn't even a community here in Irving. Now there's not just a community in Irving, there is the community in Irving. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Alhamdulillah. Right? And so there's a lot of great stuff going on. Inshallah, not this weekend, 
but the following weekend, the weekend of March the 15th, inshallah, um, here at ICI, they're going to be having the annual Dawah conference. And, um, you know, there's, there's a whole slew of different activities planned from uh, Friday khutbah focusing on da'wah to Friday evening lectures and activities. On Saturday all day long there will be workshops and activities and programs and lectures for the whole community. Q&A sessions, right? Really beneficial stuff focused around the theme and the subject of da'wah. And particularly on Saturday will also be an open house all day long where people can come in and visit the masjid and ask questions and get to know things about Islam. So inshallah, it'll be a really valuable weekend full of different activities. And they're bringing in some very special guests, alhamdulillah. Um, I'll be here personally participating, but I honestly, I'm just here to show support and I'm only coming, like, I'll only be speaking because they asked me to speak. But honestly, otherwise I'd be coming to just attend and benefit as well. But we'll be having some specialists People who are really doing some remarkable stuff in the area of da'wah, inshallah they'll be coming here to share their knowledge, their experience, and their wisdom in the field of da'wah with us. Uh, there's a brother by the name of Hamza Sortzis, who's from the UK, who's from England. Mashallah, he's done a lot of work online. He's very popular on the internet, on YouTube. He's done some remarkable stuff. Uh, he runs a da'wah organization there in the UK, so he's coming. And of course, Brother Mujahid Fletcher from Houston, who runs the project Islam in Spanish. He's going to be coming as well, inshallah, and sharing his knowledge and his insights and his experience. So it's going to be a very, very beneficial weekend. So let's inshallah try to come, attend, and learn about our responsibility towards humanity. Bidnillahi ta'ala. So make sure everyone who's here, please attend and spread the word to others. More importantly, I know all of y'all will attend, but please spread the word to others as well. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasakfiru wa natubu ilayk.